a Galilean wedding. You say, what's the difference? You'll find out in a little bit. The Galileans, they were rebels. Anytime a rebellion broke out in ancient Israel, it always started in Galilee. These guys knew how to fight. And they did things differently. And in explaining what happened, not just explaining, showing you what people did for their weddings, it will open up the Bible. It will open up the Bible in ways that maybe you never expected, never even imagined. But you know the disciples, when they heard Jesus talk about a Galilean wedding, you say, you're talking about John chapter 2, aren't you? The wedding in Cana, because that was Galilee. No, I'm not. John chapter 2 really doesn't tell us anything about their weddings except they had them. That's about it. Well, where else did they talk about it? I have news for you. Jesus spoke about it a lot. The disciples also spoke about it, including the Apostle Paul. He brings it up in a couple of places. And the book of Revelation brings it up as well. I want you to understand something about the Bible. This might be news to you. It might not. The Bible is an easy book to understand. Yeah, you're laughing, you're like, right. Uh, uh, well, maybe you like that, but the Bible's a revelation. You knew that, didn't you? It's a revealing. It's not a hiding. And when something was said by someone, whether it was Moses or another prophet or a poet, or whether it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that when they spoke, they spoke in a way in which the people understood. Why do we have a Bible? Why did God send us Jesus? Because God wants to be understood to the extent to which he's revealed himself. He wants to be known to the extent to which he's revealed himself. So he makes it simple. Who are the people who heard Jesus speak? Illiterate starving peasants mostly and they understood every word of what he said the disciples understood every word of what he said they didn't always know where he was going with it boy they got a lot of stuff wrong but they understood what he said tonight you're gonna learn how to understood understand what he said and it's through a Galilean wedding now what about this Galilean wedding thing well, first of all, I got to tell you how weddings worked in those days, how they kind of started. First of all, how do two people get together nowadays? Oh, you see each other across the room. The music begins to play. There's a twinkle in your eyes, and it's love at first sight. <laughs> no, that's not the way it worked. You see, back in the old days, people would get together in a variety of different ways. As a matter of fact, we could come up with a million different scenarios, so I'm going to give you the easiest hypothetical. Most weddings in the days of Jesus were arranged marriages. Now, some of you are going, oh, no, that would be terrible, especially you younger people. Those of you who are older and have children say, I wish we could do that now. But you know, ah, yes, you know, you agree. But most of the weddings were arranged marriages. So we're going to do a very simple one where I just set up a hypothetical for a wedding. And it will be an arranged marriage, and it would be with two children whose papas live to a ripe old age because, of course, the mortality rate was terrible back in those days. So we'll just make it simple, and we'll say the papas live, the families are alive, and the marriage is put together by the papas. And here's what would happen. The way a wedding would start, a marriage would start, would be, let's say you have a, a man who is oh, a merchant or some sort of other type of uh, living in, in a village, and he's going to do his business during the day, whatever it might be. And he's walking through the village, and he's having conversations with people, going about his business, and he notices there's some sound off to the side. There's children playing, and people love children back in those days as much as they do now. And he looks over, and he notices there's, there's a little girl down there playing with her siblings and maybe some friends, and, and she's giggling and laughing. And he looks at her and then takes another look. She's very clean. She's very studious. She has a very good attitude. She's pretty. She looks strong and healthy. She's four years old. I'll bet she'd make a really good bride for my son. You say, that's crazy. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, understand something in those days. 
that a marriage was not based on romance. Romance didn't put food on the table. Romance didn't make your family stronger. Romance didn't make your family more powerful politically. When people got together, when parents arranged marriages, a lot of it had to do with strengthening the family. You tie in with another family, they tie in with you, suddenly you have doubled your power base in the town, maybe your economic base. Remember King Solomon had all those hundreds of wives? Was it because he'd be going down the road as king and he'd see a beautiful woman and say to his head guard, uh, bring her into my harem, I'd like to make her my next wife? Not in the least. Those 700 wives he had were mostly political marriages, marrying the sister or the daughter of another king or a city-state, and what it did was it made political pacts between him and other people, and it made his kingdom strong. The concubines that he had were the real problem. The concubines were there, as they would say back in those days, for fun, you see. And that was a big, big sin. So King Solomon, he built his base on all these arranged marriages. You, you do the same thing. So here's the papa, and he sees the little girl playing, and he says, I know who her father is. She's coming along well. I'm going to go ask her father if she can marry my son. And so he starts making arrangements. He begins to put together a great feast, kind of like what you see here, for his family and the family of the little girl. Then he sends one of his family members over to the little girl's father's house, and he pounds on the door, and he says, I have a gospel for you. Wait a minute, what's that all about? We know what the gospel is, right? You preach the gospel, people get saved, right? In those days, a gospel meant something else. The message of Christ was attached to the word. You know what gospel meant? Well, you know, good news. But wait a minute, let's define it. These people didn't think the way we do. They didn't abstract well. They were extremely literal, very, very concrete and practical. Gospel meant a message given to another person that contained absolutely no bad news and was always good news. Yeah. Well, I like that. If you had someone come to your door in the middle of the night and knock on your door, you know that's not going to be good news. The phone goes off in the middle of the night. That's not going to be good news. In that day of mortality, people dying all over the place, wars, pestilence, plagues, famines, somebody brings news, you know chances are it's all going to be bad. If somebody pounds on your door and says, I have a gospel for you, you want to hear it because it's always good news. Always. And so you go and open the door for that gospel, that message that's coming in which there is no bad news. Those of you that are afraid or fearful or nervous about sharing the salvation message of Christ, remember that. Your message contains no bad news. And I love to give messages like that because I give too many messages that are bad news. Oh, I'd love to tell you good news. And that's what's happening. So the guy goes to the door and he pounds on the door and he says, I have a gospel. And they say, what is it? And they said, my dad, let's say it's his son that comes to the door, has invited you, the father of this little girl, to come to his house for a feast. And you drop everything right there and you go. You say, I couldn't do that. You couldn't do that because you have a clock. They didn't have clocks back then. They just dropped everything and went. So off he goes to the house, and the papa of the little boy, who is about five years old, the man's son, meets the papa at the door and greets him handily, and they come in, and they sit down at the table, and they begin to feast for a day or two, maybe longer. And the papa of the boy wines and dines the papa of the girl until finally he pops the question. Of course, the other guy has figured it out by now, but how about my son and your daughter becoming engaged to be married? And if the man agrees, which, why would he disagree after all of that food and all of that good news? And so they agree, then immediately they bring in a scribe, whether it's a family member or somebody who is paid to read and write. And the scribe begins to write down what these two men talk about in perfect duplicate. There has to be two exact copies of what they're about to say. What they're going to write down is the agreement of the terms of the wedding of this little boy and this little girl. 
they're going to write out something called a ketubah. You might have heard the name ketubah. Of course, that's a different pronunciation of it. A ketubah, it's a covenant. And it's got to be done in exact duplicate. So what they would do is the scribe would come, and the scribe would begin to write things down. Uh, not yet, guys. That's right. I scared you, didn't I? It's okay. But, you know, they, they have something they're going to help me with in just a little bit. But they would begin to write things down. What are you going to write it on? You go down to Staples and get some pens and paper? No, you're going to write it on whatever you can. In the case of a richer people, they might write it into clay tablets or on something else, but you might have to scratch it onto a pottery shard, or you might even have to engrave it into leather. Because what are you going to write on back then? So the scribe begins to write down what these two men do. They start bargaining. First thing, item of business, the price of the bride. We have to agree on the price of the bride. And they haggle back and forth like they're haggling for merchandise. And they finally settle on 20 camels and 10 donkeys and a small flock of sheep. And that goes down in duplicate, in exact duplicate, in these two different documents that they have. They're identical to each other. And that's written down. And then the dowry is discussed. The dowry involved the bride's possessions, certain things that she might have in her, her living space at her house. Now, remember, they didn't have private rooms back then, but she did have a certain amount of property. And property would be bestowed on her. But ultimately, it came down to coinage. Some coins that would manage the, the bride if anything happened to the bridegroom. If the bridegroom were injured or he died or, God forbid, he left, then it would be either her alimony or it would be her welfare because they didn't have anything in those days. And so that had to be discussed. And the father of the bride had to provide that. That amount goes down. They would haggle back and forth on how much bronze or whatever it might be. And then they would haggle on, are you ready for this? <laughs> How many kids and of what gender? You say, how do you do that? I don't know, but a lot of ancient ketubahs had that information in it. Have you ever wondered why it was such a disgrace, this all fell on the woman, but for the women not to have children in those days? It was not only a disgrace that they couldn't have children just for the fact that children were loved and enjoyed, and then, of course, it's the next generation. But some of it came from the fact that it was in the ketubah, that they were to have so many kids. And if a woman couldn't have kids, then it was a breach of contract. And that was shameful. And that was a society that was driven by shame. We're a society driven by guilt. They were driven by shame. And if you think about Sarah and Rebecca and all of these others who couldn't have kids, God miraculously gave them some. But originally, it would have been a breach of this contract. And all kinds of other things would have gone into this ketubah. And finally, when it's decided, then the two papas agree, is this it? And they would say yes and amen to it. And then the scribe would sign his name to it. And they might put a mark on it. They might not. But it's agreed to. And then a lesser copy would be given to the father of the bride. And a greater copy would be given to the father of the bridegroom. Lesser and greater. Size. That's it. One's bigger, one's smaller. And they would give it to each other. And then the papas would part, and the other papa would go home to his house and to the little girl. And he would take his ketubah, and the other fellow would too. And both of them would put it into what we would call the family safe. They would call it their most sacred shrine. Now, that doesn't mean they have some sort of a little idol in the corner. It just means it's where they kept all the ceremonial things, like ceremonial plates and cups and, and things that were used for very, very important religious purposes. And they would put it in there until the children came of age at the ripe old age of maybe 14 or 15. You say, that's awfully young. Yeah, but it solves a lot of problems, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, the longer, the older you get when you're with somebody that you want to marry, the more temptation tends to overtake you. And so they would go very, very early. And when they came of age, then the families would be beginning to communicate again to say, it's about time that we got these two publicly betrothed. So they would work up to a betrothal ceremony. They would pick a day, two days after the next Sabbath. We're going to start in the morning, and then we're going to do it. And the families would know when they begin to make preparations. And then the day finally comes. It's the day of the betrothal for the bride and the bridegroom, these two young people with their whole families. And the first thing that happens in that morning is the bride and the bridegroom would be awakened at their separate homes. The bridegroom with his friends, his brothers, boys that are his buddies, the girl with her sisters and her friends and her mother, they would wake the, the, the bride and the bridegroom up separately and they would get them dressed nicely, not 
so much in the clothes that they'll be wearing on their wedding day, but in very nice clothes, as best as they could do, especially for peasants who usually only had one change of clothes. They're going to put them in the best thing they can. And then as they get them ready, they give them a little bit of food, and then the boy with his friends and his papa, they go to the synagogue. The girl with her friends and her papa, they go to the synagogue separately at different times because they can't see each other the day of their betrothal. Is this sounding familiar at all? I think it's kind of where some of our traditions came from. I can't confirm it, but it sounds right. I'm not sure, but it sounds right. And here's why they can't be at the synagogue at the same time. The boy is with all males. The girl is with all females. They go to the synagogue because they have to ceremonially cleanse themselves. Every time there's going to be a very sacred event, the people involved would cleanse themselves. If there was going to be a sacrifice, you would cleanse yourself. If there's going to be a covenant made, which is what a betrothal is, they would cleanse themselves and all kinds of other things. You'd start a vow, you'd cleanse yourself. You'd end a vow, you'd cleanse yourself. And you would do it through something called a mikvah. Now, those of you who don't know what a mikvah is, it's a ceremonial cleansing bath. And it's just a hole that's carved out of bedrock, lined with plaster. It's got usually seven steps to the bottom with a little divider in the middle and seven steps back up. Seven, of course, being the perfect number. It's in the Bible a lot, the number of God and all of that. And there would be about maybe waist-high water in the bottom that would be considered living water. Living water was not an abstract to them. It wasn't some sort of a spiritual concept. Living water was simply moving water, water that was moving. It was pure. It was fresh. It was life-giving. It was health-promoting. It was, in this case, it would probably be from rain, but it could be from a stream or a babbling brook or an artesian well or a spring. It was something you could always drink. It wasn't from a well or a cistern that was, that was polluted. That gives a whole different concept to living water, doesn't it? When the Holy Spirit comes out of you, Jesus said, when he comes out of you, it will be refreshing to others. Like living water. He always painted a very concrete picture for people because they didn't abstract well at all. Well, they would go down into this living water and they would have to do it like this. First of all, all the guys are there. And they would have some privacy for the boy. We're just going to pick on the boy. We'll leave the girl to herself. They, they did the same thing later on. But the boy would come to the mikvah and they would leave him to some privacy, and he would have to do it, sorry, i got to be bold here, but he would have to do it naked. So this is the way that you would do a, 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 a mikvah cleansing. You would strip yourself down, and you would walk down the seven steps into this living water, into this pure water, to cleanse yourself for the sacred thing you're about to do. Now, you don't get out the soap and the brush and the towel and all that. You don't do that. All you do is you dip down into the mikvah till it's about waist high, and then you scrunch down until all your hair is underwater. And then you stand back up again, you step out, you dry off, you're done. Now this is how they thought back in these days. I'm trying to get you into their heads. I know this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but bear with me on it because it opens some things up. So the boy goes there and he goes through the ceremonial cleansing and now he is cleansed, he is pure, he is ready to enter into this, this holy covenant that they're about to make when they get betrothed publicly. The girl does the same thing. What's the deal with this cleansing? Well, let me tell you what they knew. Remember, they didn't abstract. They understood what this meant exactly. You see, here's the concept. You're going to enter into something holy, something sacred. So you want to tell God, I want to be as pure and holy as I can when I'm about to do what I'm about to do. In this case, get betrothed. So stripping down, you step down into the water, and you scrunch down into a fetal position until your hair is completely underwater. I know I just told you this, but listen again. Until your hair is completely underwater, and then you stand up, and you step out of the water, and the moment your foot leaves that water, something happens to you. The Jews always believed, as the Christians do, that... We all, since Adam, are now born with a sinful nature. In fact, David took it a step further when he said, I was conceived in sin. Conceiving a child is not a sin, but the sin nature that we have, the fact that we can do things wrong and we have the capacity for it, and we're good at it, comes all the way from Adam. And you know it, because when a child is born, 
and then they learn to talk. What are their first words? Mama, Papa, and no! Right? Or mine! They learn very quickly. The sin nature sets in. But the Jews, as well as us Christians, have always believed that when, although people are conceived in sin and have this sinful nature, that there was one time in your life that even though you had the sinful nature, you couldn't possibly sin. And that was in the water of your mother's womb. It makes sense, doesn't it? That's what the mikvah meant. And they would go down into the mikvah, scrunch down into a fetal position. They would stand back up, and then they would step out of the water, having dipped into the water of their mother's womb, gone back into it, and the moment they come out of that water, they had an expression for what happened to you. You were born again. You say, well, Jesus was playing riddles with Nicodemus with that. He was certainly not. Nicodemus knew what it meant. They probably had the conversation near or over the top of a mikvah because they were in Jerusalem and around the temple. It's just covered with mikvahs on around the outside of it, hundreds and hundreds of them. Nicodemus' problem was, how do I really lose my sin? Because going into that doesn't do anything for me, and I know it. I really need to get rid of my sin. And then Jesus takes the conversation a whole other way, and you get it. He was communicating right where Nicodemus needed to understand, and he understood born again. So here comes the boy and the girl later, and they dip, and they come out, and they are born again. It was as if they had lost their sin, even though it didn't happen. They were saying to God, I want to be as pure now as I was the day before I was ever born. And that was their symbolic act towards God, saying, this is what I want to be when I'm about to do what I'm going to do. And so the boy, the girl, they would do it separately. You can see why they couldn't see each other that day. It would have been a really bad thing. And then they go back to their homes. The families begin to pack up musical instruments and all kinds of things. They make sure that they're dressed right. The food is there. It's going to be a marvelous thing. And then both families emerge out of their houses, one starting, making noises, blowing a shofar, kind of like what you saw but different than what we had here. The family during the day partying in the streets, dancing and cheering and singing, blowing trumpets, beating drums as they make their way towards the, the village gate. Why the gate? Because the Romans invented the, uh, the Romans, the Greeks invented the town square, and the gate was the place where all the merchants were during the time of Jesus in that, in the, among the Hebrews. They would do all their business at the gate. So the gate is the place you want because all the people are there, it's the bottleneck. There's lots and lots of people there. And you want people around your betrothal ceremony because guests aren't important. Witnesses are. And they're all there just kind of waiting for the next thing to happen. So you and your family, if you're the boy in the family, they're weaving through the street and they're singing and dancing and having a great time heading towards the gate. The girl's family hears that they come bursting out of their house, singing and beating drums and dancing. And people realize, hey, that sounds like there's going to be a betrothal. Let's go watch. And they all go down to the gate. The families cram through that little narrow space as they weave through the gate. They come out the other side. And then a group of boys carrying a bundle of poles with cloth wrapped around the top. They come out and they find a likely spot outside the gate and they say, this is the spot. They set the poles upright and then all four boys each grab a pole and they pull outwards. And suddenly you have a canopy supported by four poles, a hoopa is what it's called, H-U-P-P-A in English. And this is a canopy under which the betrothal ceremony is going to take place. What about the wedding? We saw in Fiddler on the Roof, they did the wedding under the hoopah. They didn't do weddings under hoopahs in those days, they did betrothals. The wedding was this done deal, but the betrothal was making the deal. And what's the deal with the hoopah? What does that mean? Maybe you've heard that they would put a prayer shawl on top of it. And it would be under prayers from the Lord. It's a neat idea, but it's a more recent idea. The ancient idea between, uh, behind the hoopah, when God made a covenant with his people, with Moses, Moses, the first thing that the people were told to do, they were to cleanse themselves ceremonially. Three days later, Moses goes up on the mountain, and what happens? The glory of God in a cloud descends upon the mountain, and then God speaks to Moses, and the covenant is made. 
They were modeling their ceremony after God giving Moses the covenant. The hopa is the glory of God descending, as it were, on the place of the covenant, which is going to take place right underneath that hoopa. Well, there are people around. There are merchants. There might be a caravan coming by. There are beggars. There are thieves. There are lawyers. There are all kinds of people at the city gate, the elders of the town. And they see the hoopa go up and they say, hey, there's going to be a ceremony. Let's go watch because what else are you going to do with your day? They're not exactly listening to iPods, you know. So they all gather around in this huge mass, and here are both families surrounding the hoopah. And in the, underneath the hoopah is the bride and the groom, and the father of the bride and the father of the groom step forward, and now the betrothal begins. Could I ask the bride and the groom and the father of the bride and the father of the groom to please come up, and we'll show you how this worked. And this is really, really mind-blowing. It opens up the Scripture. So watch what happens. Now, I'm going to tell you something about this, this, this betrothal as they're coming up here. The betrothal was a legal wedding. You say, well, wait a minute, you're confusing me. They do a wedding later, they do a, the betrothal now. The betrothal legally wed the bride and the bridegroom. So why do they need a wedding? Well, you'll see in a minute, but the actual wedding took place a year after this. You say, that's confusing. I know, traditions are weird, aren't they? But this is what they did. So why don't you guys step in just a little bit here. So the canopy's over the top of them. You can picture it. And the hoopas here, and they're kind of in the shade. The papas are here. And all the witnesses gathered around. They're waiting for something to happen because it's a really boring day without this. And so the, the ketubah is brought out, and it's read publicly. They bring out the ketubahs that they brought out of their most sacred little shrine. It's read publicly. All the terms of the marriage are read so that everybody hears them, so that both papas hear them, so that the children hear them, so that the rest of the family hears them, so that nobody can say, I didn't know that detail was in there. See? Your witnesses. And of course, once it's read and both men agree, do you agree that this is proper? It's been read publicly. All the terms are good. The terms are good. Then all the witnesses knew to do something. They knew to shout, Amen. They knew to shout, Amen. No, no, no. They knew to shout, Amen. Very good. That meant you can't go back from here. You admitted that it was correct and right. We shout, Amen. We are witnesses. They all shouted, Amen. Then, as the ketubah has been read, you've read the price of the bride. The bride had to be purchased. Do you remember the Apostle Paul telling over in 1 Corinthians, you were bought with a price? Please don't forget, it doesn't just apply to slaves, but in that context, it applies to a bride because brides had to be paid for. You were bought with a price, bride of Christ. Christians, who the Bible calls the bride of Christ, you were bought bought with a price, a terrible, wonderful price. You were bought with a price. She's bought with a price. But her price that she's bought with is a little bit different. It's 20 camels, 10 donkeys, and a small flock of sheep. And the father of the bridegroom brings it in for the father of the bride to inspect, to make sure that it's proper publicly so that everybody knows as he inspects the animals that when he accepts the terms... When he, is he, oh, okay, a little haggling going on here still. Okay, when he accepts the terms, that means that he can't go back on of it and say, I didn't know that that donkey was too short or something like that. He sees it all, it's all brought out, he counts it. Is the price of the bride correct? Is it proper? It is. You agree? All the witnesses then shout. Then the dowry is brought out, and it's brought out in the form of some coins that the papa of the bride is now going to present to the papa of the bridegroom to inspect. Only to inspect, though. He won't be hanging on to it, but he has to make sure, counting it out and knowing the weight is right, that this is what was agreed upon in that ketubah, in that covenant that they made with each other. And is it proper? It is. It is proper. So tell is it the, the father of the bride, is it proper? It is proper. Okay, so all the witnesses shout! Amen. You realize something could go wrong at any one of these points, and it could turn into a riot. I mean, it could go really, really bad. So this is going very well. So you hand, the, of course, the, the price of the uh, dowry back to the father of the bride, who will take keep it, <laughs> and he will keep it on account in case anything happens to the bridegroom. Now, 
The most important part begins. Everything focuses down to what's happening under the chuppah. The next thing that happens is that the bridegroom gives the bride some gifts. He gives her the wedding gifts now. In this case, it would be a bracelet and perhaps a necklace. It could be just about anything that he gives her, including a ring or even a wedding ring. You know what a wedding ring was in those days? A little gold nose ring. That was a wedding ring. But he would give her a lovely gift, and she would really appreciate it, and all the guests would ooh and ah at the gifts that he gave. But what, wait a minute, what about this? What if his family is too poor, her family is too poor, to give gifts like that? Then what do you do? Well, all you need to do is the bridegroom in front of all the people would pull out a single coin. This happens to be a 1950-year-old bronze prutah. It's an old coin from Israel, and it's worth about a nickel back in those days. But if you were very, very poor, and about 80% of the people in that region were so poor, this might be all they had. He would take a single coin and hold it up before all the witnesses and then present it to his bride. What he's just done is given her not just a nickel, he's given her everything he's got. And that makes the gift a whole lot more valuable, even though it's just a single little coin like that. So he's given the gifts. The gifts have exchanged there. She gives him a gift, which we don't know really from ancient writings. People didn't write a lot about the content of these weddings as far as gifts goes. So we don't know really what a bride would have given a bridegroom. It could have been just about anything. But what we're going to pretend here is that he gives her, gives, she gives him rather, a jar of perfume which will be real handy on their wedding night in the days of no deodorant. So this will make him smell lovely for their wedding night. He will hold on to it and cherish it until that time. And of course, perfume was a valuable gift. And so we'll just pretend that he get, she gave him perfume. But now the gifts are exchanged, and now the really important part begins. This is where all the wedding witnesses, you guys, hold your breath. Don't turn blue, but hold your breath. The bridegroom is now handed a pitcher and a cup. In the pitcher is wine that is not diluted. For a feast like what you see behind me, the wine would be diluted at least four parts water to one part wine. If you come to my house and have water, in order to sterilize the water, I would add a little wine to it. I would wine my water. You would be able to catch a little flavor, but no alcohol content to speak of, just enough to make it safe to drink. But when it was pure, it was ceremonial purposes only. And this cup, in a ceremony like this, was known as the cup of joy because it had pure wine in it, undiluted, meaning you'd only drink it by the sip. And so he pours the cup with this pure ceremonial wine in it, which is really good wine. And then he takes the cup and he holds it very, very sacred-like, because it's a very, very important thing. What happens here is everything. He takes the cup with the wine. He doesn't drink it. He hands it to his bride. Now, press the pause button for a second. When he extends the cup to his bride, I want you to listen. Those of you that know your Bibles well, this will really mean a lot to you. As he extends the cup to his bride, she is handed all authority. This was an arranged marriage. But this now becomes her out. If she doesn't want him for her husband, she, think of the theological implications here, she rejects the cup by pushing it back at the bridegroom. If she does that, everybody knows that she is calling the wedding off and it's her right to do so. There would be fights, riots breaking out, all kinds of terrible things would happen. Oh, what a mess it would be. The witnesses would go nuts. The families would start duking it out. But nobody would question her right to reject that man at this one moment because she's given all the right to do so. But if she wants him, she takes the cup, that sacred cup of joy with both hands, and she takes a sip, indicating, I will take this man as my beloved husband. What will she do? Ah, and she takes the cup. She takes the sip. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief. And of course, then the bridegroom takes the cup from her and takes a sip himself. And once he takes that sip, the covenant has been made and ratified with the sip of wine, and all the witnesses shout. Amen. And now at this moment, they are officially married. But they can't live as husband and wife for a year. 
That was their tradition. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. But in the meantime, I've got to step through here, and I've got to tell you something about this covenant. I keep saying this thing, Ketubah, which is the document, a covenant, which is what they made. Those of you who are married, when you got married, you made a covenant. Now, as a pastor, and I'm a full-time pastor, I do premarital counseling, and most unfortunately, occasionally I have to do marriage counseling. When I do it, I always start the sessions with the couples in the exact same way. There's no problem with this. I ask the couples whether they're in trouble or whether they want to get married. Some of you might say they are in trouble then, aren't they? <laughs> but I would ask this question. I will say, what is marriage? And do you know that all the time I get the same one-word answer every single time? They say, uh, which means that everything that comes next, well, I'm guessing, I'm making it up, I'm taking my best shot at it, but I don't really know. And finally, they will say, well, I've had some people go as low as saying, it's just a piece of paper. Well, it's a license. Well, it's a, a commitment to each other to love, honor, and obey until death us do part. Well, you're mostly right on that. But rarely does anybody say it's a covenant. If anybody asks you, what is marriage? Your answer is covenant. Right now, covenant. Covenant. Great. So the second question I ask them is, what is a covenant? And I get that great one word answer. Uh, and then they, whatever comes next, they're guessing at, and they'll say, well, it's kind of a commitment, a contract that's really sacred between you and God. Well, it is. But it's a lot more than that. To those people in this time and to people in the Middle East today who are natives to that area, whether they're Arabs, whether they're Jews, whether they're Muslims, whether they're Christians, and there are lots of Christian Arabs in that area, they know what a covenant is. But about 1900 in the Western world, the whole concept was forgotten. Nobody really knows why, it just went away. It was probably pushed out of the way by the Romantic movements that swept through Europe and finally North America. What is a covenant? A covenant is something that two people do publicly in front of witnesses. You can't make a covenant without witnesses. Why do you have witnesses at weddings? Why do you have wedding guests? We don't know. Sure we do. We just forgot. It's a covenant. It was a covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant makes two people related to each other. Now, that concept doesn't really stick in our heads because we abstract so well, but these people didn't. They didn't abstract well at all. And when it made two people one, it really made them one. Let me give you an example of how this works. When they partake of these vows that they made in front of each other silently with the, with the bracelets, with the exchange of gifts, with whatever it is that they did, with the reading of the ketubah and all the, the, the rules and the guidelines and the, and the commitments that they have to make in that wedding, and you all said amen to it. Once they partake of that wine, what you're looking at up here now is not just bride and groom and husband and wife. You're looking at brother and sister. That was their concept. It made two people one, as in related to each other. Now, let me give you an example. We just had a phenomenon happen here in America that just captured everybody's attention because something was on the line. Money. It was called the Powerball Lottery. <laughs> yeah, you're going, I bought those and didn't win. Yeah, okay. Here's the thing. Let's say that you have an eccentric brother. Some of you are thinking, how do you know my brother? <laughs> you have an eccentric brother. You don't hear from your brother much because he's very eccentric. And then one day he calls you up. And he says, I have some good news and bad news. Whoa, okay. Well, what's the good news? I won the Powerball lottery. I'm a billionaire. <gasps> really? Here's the bad news. The bad news is, you know how I hate technology. You know how I dislike crowds and people. You know how I just like to be alone. I have, with my money, bought an island somewhere in the South Pacific. 
that only I know about and the people who stocked it with enough food and shelter for to last the rest of my life. There's no electricity, there's no phones, there's no satellite, there's no internet, there's nothing. And I'm going there to live for the rest of my life. And you'll never see me again. And then he does. And you never see him again. Now here's my question to you. Is that man still your brother? Yes! Why? Because you're blood. You're related to each other. When you make a covenant with someone, you are now related to each other. And um, remember, we forgot what a covenant was around 1900. But way before then, back in the 1600s, the Anglicans came up with a little prayer book. Some of you are familiar with this thing. In that Anglican book of common prayer, towards the end, there is the ceremony that those of you who are married, most of you have used part of it in your wedding. It's part of our now Western tradition for weddings. And in there, it goes through the love, honor, and obey until death us do part. When is your brother, whether he's living in the South Pacific or right here in, the, in this area, when is he not your brother anymore? When one of you dies. Until death us do part. It's not a sentiment. Our marriage ceremonies have become sentimental and there's no force to them. We don't hold true to our promises because promises have become very easy to break and renege on treacherously in our culture today. In their culture, they knew the moment they took that cup and everybody shouted amen, they are one. They are brother and sister, and the only way out is death. Now, they didn't hold to it. They had divorce in Jesus' day. And they still do in the Middle East, but the divorce was way down as far as a rate goes because they understood the gravity of it. Which brings me to something I also need to say to many of you in this room, and I don't know most of you in this room. Some of you are thinking, but I've been divorced. Some of you, I've been divorced many times. What about me? I have some very interesting news for you. Jesus said twice in the book of Revelation something you need to remember at this moment on and now behave appropriately. He said, behold, I make all things new. How much is all? How much is all? I make all things new. He gives us, he's the God of second chances, and he gives us a new start. But a covenant is until death us do part, because when two people made a covenant together, especially a marriage covenant, they were related. And what you're looking at now is brother and sister, not just husband and wife. That's how a covenant worked. And it had to be ratified by witnesses who would see it, watch it happen, and all shout, which told them they can't get out of it now. If your marriage is a mess, I want to say one thing to you. Your foundation is bedrock and it's fine. The house is in shambles. Rebuild the house. Rebuild the house. The covenant is fine. You say, I didn't make a covenant. You certainly did. You just might not have known you were doing it at the time, but that's exactly what you did in the eyes of God and people. Rebuild the house if your house is messed up. Got it? Now, from the scriptures, four times in the New Testament alone, one time meaning sex, the other three times meaning covenant. A man will leave his father and mother, cleave only unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's not a reference to sex. That's a reference to brother and sister. Do you see it now? That's you and the Lord, bride of Christ. But it's you, husbands and wives, or those who will be someday. Remember that. Now I gotta show you something really cool. Watch this. So, the bridegroom poured the cup of wine, gave it to the bride. She took a sip. She hands it back to him. The bridegroom then takes the sip. Go ahead and take the sip again. As he takes the sip, everybody shouts! Yeah! 
the covenant's been made, and then the bridegroom would say, in your hearing, all you witnesses, he would say to his bride, you are now covenanted to me by the laws of Moses and Israel, and I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it anew with you in my father's house. Yeah, you're saying, no, Jesus wasn't talking about a wedding. Yes, he was. The disciples heard wedding. They didn't know where he was going with it, but they heard wedding because that's what a wedding did. Ratified with the cup, you are now joined, you are betrothed, you are officially husband and wife, but in a moment the bride and groom, the husband and wife are going to part ways for a year and not be together for a while until finally they come back together again at a wedding. Is this starting to sound familiar? It's a Galilean wedding. Now wait, it gets better. So, uh, oh, the Jesus, in case you didn't know this, Jesus at the Last Supper, I, 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 some of you might be new to the Bible, so you may have heard at the Last Supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup means the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the remission of sins of many. Drink this, for I will not drink it again until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. See, at the Last Supper, at the Last Supper, at the Last Supper, that's when he did it. Okay, so... The last thing that happens, and of course you good witnesses are waiting for this, uh, then the bridegroom is handed a veil that he's picked out, and it's a new veil for his bride, and he hands it to her, his bride, and this seals everything. She takes the veil, and she puts it on, covering her face, leaving it only so that her eyes can see, and as she does so, she will wear this veil every single time she leaves her house until they are joined together in a marriage ceremony. This is to say that I am taken. She walks around the village, and everybody knows that she is a betrothed bride. This veil becomes, as it were, a wall of bronze between her and anybody that might want to take her or seek her out. But it also says something else. The veil is her purity. She's telling the whole world and the watching world that as I wear this veil, I am keeping myself pure for my bridegroom, for he is a magnificent bridegroom. I will tell you this, folks. As Christians, we, the bride of Christ, wear a veil. It is called our purity. Purity is something to be compromised in our world today. Purity is a something that's being compromised in churches because we have an evolving society. We do not have an evolving God. We do not have an evolving Bible. And God tells us to keep ourselves pure for a very important reason. Pure on His standards because we are betrothed to Him. We are keeping ourselves pure until our bridegroom comes for us. That's your veil, Christians. Don't take it off. Wear the veil. When you go out, let people see your purity. They will call you names. They will try and get you to compromise. It's your purity. Wear your veil until your bridegroom comes. And she will do this every time she steps outside the house. The veil goes on. I want to throw in one little footnote here. When they part, in just a moment, the bridegroom and his father and the family are going back to their house, and he's going to begin doing some things. The bride and her family are going to go back to her house, and they're going to begin doing some things for the course of a year. This is called the betrothal period. It's a period of about a year where they're away from each other. They do see each other chaperoned once in a while to get to know each other. But they're busy with some things. And while they're apart from each other, she's to keep herself pure, he's to keep himself pure. She's evident because of the veil. But here's the thing. When Mary, the mother of Jesus, became pregnant by the Holy Spirit, it was during the betrothal period when she was wearing a veil. Not whether she was wearing it at that time or not, that's neither here nor there, but it was the time when she would traditionally wear that veil. You can see the price that she and Joseph had to pay when she turns up pregnant during the betrothal period and Joseph is not the father. Obviously it was the Holy Spirit, but what did the town people think? Did they believe that? There was a terrible price to pay for having the Son of God, and she did so willingly. 
took an angel to convince Joseph, and then he did so willingly too. But I just thought I'd throw that little footnote in there. Well, now that she has the veil on, she puts the veil on, now she's going to live her life pure. All the witnesses know this is the end of the ceremony, so the witnesses all shout! Amen. And they shout another hearty! Amen. And it is now done. And everybody goes back to their business. The hoopah is packed up. The papa and the son go back to their house with the parade, the singing, the dancing in the street. The bride with her family goes back to her house. The parade, the singing, the dancing in the street. And would you guys please give these actors up here a big hand. Thank you for helping. You can have a seat. So they go back to their houses and they begin to embark on some projects that are going to take a year. Here's what's going to happen next. The bride goes back to her house with her bridesmaids. They have to get ready for the wedding. Well, it's a year away. How hard could it be? Very difficult. You see, she's got to have a wedding dress. The wedding dresses in those days that they wanted the brides to wear were big and billowing. They looked like they even had a hoop skirt, except it wasn't a hoop. It was just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of cloth. And then she would borrow, if they were rich, they could own, <laughs> but she would borrow all kinds of jewelry, necklaces, and, and, and uh, almost like crowns that they would put on their heads. It might be made out of silver or pewter. If they're rich, maybe gold. But the more necklaces she had on, the better it was. You look at all the necklaces our bride has on, not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. You wouldn't want to fall into a river. You'd go straight to the bottom with all the stuff that they would wear. She'd wear bottles of pure perfume. She'd have things around her neck that actually contained things that were written, passages of Scripture, and all of these other, just all kinds of things. She would have bracelets that went all the way up her arm. The, the, where do you get all of this? You've got to borrow it. You've got to find all these people. Can I borrow it for that day? And then, not only that, but how do you build a dress like that? If you're poor and you only have one change of clothes, you've got to bargain. You've got to find ways to go with the passing caravans. Now remember, Israel is a land bridge. To the west is the ocean. To the east is another sea, a sea of sand that cannot be crossed. You have to go north or south out of Israel. You can't go due east anywhere. You have to arc up over the top. That's called the Silk Road. It runs all the way from China, comes across, sometimes going to Europe, but going south through Israel down into Africa and down into Arabia. And so there are all kinds of different types of cloth and silk and things coming, and she could bargain for bits and pieces of these cloth and begin with her bridesmaids, which are her sisters and her friends, and her mother, putting together this enormous, very, very beautiful dress, a whole new headscarf and headpiece that she would be wearing, sewing parts of her dowry all the way around the rim of the scarf. She would be gorgeous. And then she'd get her bridesmaids together they would make sure that they had oil lamps because what if the bridegroom came for the bride at night? You don't want to miss her because you didn't have light. You've got to have oil lamps ready with oil. You've heard this before, haven't you? Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish, five had oil, five didn't have it, and the five missed it. And the other five who had the oil, they had their lamps up. The bridegroom came and they went with him. See, remember the parable? Yeah, so they have to get all that together. She has a year to do it. That's a big project. He's got a bigger project. His project is he goes home with his father. Three things happen. One with the father. Now, if the father is middle class or rich, if he's poor, he's not required to do this. But if he's middle class or rich, he begins to have somebody make or he begins to purchase white linen robes. The white linen robes are to be given to all the wedding guests. You have to determine how many people are coming. The white linen robes are for when all the wedding guests come into the place of the wedding, he passes out these linen robes to everybody. It's a great honor. It's clothing. It's white. It's beautiful. It's pure. They don't have things like this. So this is a very special festive thing, and it's expensive. And he passes it out to everyone. And he does it for two reasons. Number one, he wants to honor his guests. But number two, it also makes gate crashers stand out. This is a time of very, very limited means. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000, all four Gospels refer to the 5,000, one of them to the 4,000, and they all end with the same phrase. They all ate and were full, right? Why is that detail put in there? Because for most of those people, it may have been the first time in their life they ever ate till they were full. That's the way it was in that part of the world. So if you have people having a wedding and you got a lot of people there 
you might find a way to come in so you can partake of the feast, and who's going to know the difference? But if everybody has a white robe, there's a parable about this. The parable of the great banquet over in Luke chapter 16, where there, the, a king is getting married, and it's a wedding. And, <coughs> excuse me. And as the king uh, is trying to fill up his, his banquet, it's a long story, and I'm not going to go into all the details. Finally, he gets all the people in. They're all wearing white robes except one guy standing out in the middle of all these people. And he says, what is that man doing here? And the man was speechless, and he says, throw him out. Why? <coughs> he was a gate crasher. He was not an invited guest, so he didn't have a white robe. So the papa begins to assemble white robes if he's middle class or richer. Now, the son, he's got the real big job. He's got to do two things. Number one, he's got to put together the feast. The feast has got to feed every guest for several days because the feast goes on for several days. That's a lot of food. It's expensive. It's hard to get all this food, so he's got a year to come up with the way of putting it together. He's responsible for coming up with the feast. He puts it all together in the course of a year. While he's doing that, he has to build a room onto his father's compound. Now, a compound would be, again, sort of a little settlement of people within a village and relatives stuck together. When you got married, you didn't go off and find an apartment in another town or in another part of town. You stayed with the family. They're, in fact, at the father's house. And when you built, you usually built up because there wasn't really any way to build out because you're crammed into a village. If you've ever been to the Middle East, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's no way to spread out. You've got to go up. And they could build engineering-wise about three stories tall when they were in a village. It wasn't too high, but it was high enough. After that, you're getting into some real problems and it might collapse. So he's building a room onto his father's house where they're not only going to have the nuptials, but it's also going to be where they live as husband and wife presumably for the rest of their lives. That's where they're going to live. If that sounds at all familiar, John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus says to his disciples at the Last Supper, he's just given them some terrible news. He's given them news that he's going to be betrayed. He's just told Peter he's going to deny him three times. But Jesus then says, but let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many what? mansions, right? That's the King James Version because the translators of the King James were from Elizabethan England and they didn't understand the context in which this was being spoken. Jesus was talking about a wedding. In my Father's house are many rooms. What kind of rooms? Bridal chambers. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go there to prepare a place for you that you may be with me where I am. You know the place where I'm going. When he said that, only one thing came to the disciples' minds. Wedding! Jesus is talking about a wedding. Now, where was he going with it? They didn't have a clue, and they expressed it right afterwards. Philip says, look, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough. Jesus had to correct him even on that. And it was an amazing conversation we can't go into. But you know, they heard wedding. The bridegroom goes home, adds a room onto his father's house. It's the bridal chamber. And he's going away. What did Jesus do after he rose from the dead? He went away. He's still been away, but he's coming back again someday, isn't he? In the meantime, he's adding on a bridal chamber to his father's house. They understood this. They didn't understand where he was going with it. Again, they got it all wrong, but they got the illustration right because they're knucklehead Galileans, and they understood. They got it. And I go there to prepare a place for you that you might be with me where I am. You know where I'm going. So he would add this room onto his father's house. Now, the year moves by, and suddenly it's getting on towards the date of the wedding. They all know when it's supposed to take place. It's a year later. And so the son gets done with the room. He gets done with the feast. He calls his dad over, and he says, Dad, I know the wedding's coming up, so look, here's all the feast. And he shows his father the feast, and the father does his little customary inspection and makes sure that all the olive oil's right and the wine's right and all the food is good, and, and it's ready. Good job, son. 
And then he says, now, Father, let me show you the room. The father knows what the room is like, but he's got to do it anyway. The customary inspection, he goes and looks at the room, pounds on the walls, makes sure that the bed is right. There's a pile of hay with cloth over the top of it. It's, that's where they would do it. And, and everything is good. And he says, very good, son. You're very good. And the son says, all right, Dad, I want my bride. And the father looks at him funny. No, Dad, I want my bride. I'm ready. And the father says, son, I'll tell you when. Now, here's the thing. In every wedding in the region, Judean weddings, Arab weddings, even pagan weddings that use the same format, everybody knew when the wedding was going to take place. The dad would say, day after tomorrow, son. That's when we'll do it. And then they would do it. They would have the wedding. They would all come back to the house. Except the Galileans. Those rebels, they just like to do things just a little bit different. The Galileans had a tradition that diverged from everybody else's wedding tradition in the region. It was a surprise wedding. You gotta be ready if you're the bride. You don't know when the bridegroom is coming for the bride. When Jesus was talking about his coming to the earth to rule and reign as Messiah over the whole world, has he done that yet? No. Is he going to do it? Yes. yes. He said, listen, guys, you want to know when it's going to happen? No one knows the day or the hour, not the angels of heaven, not even the Son, only the Father knows, so you must be ready. When they heard that, Jesus wasn't speaking in abstracts. He wasn't stating data. He was using an illustration from their own wedding, which all of his disciples were Galileans. You know the tradition. When the Son comes, it's because the Father tells him it's okay to do so, and you don't know when he's coming. you got to be ready. It's a surprise wedding. Jesus' second coming looks like a Galilean wedding. And he went way out of his way to make sure that his disciples knew that. And now you know it too. It's plain as the nose on my face. I mean, it's right there. Son, I'll tell you when. Now, you've got to remember, guys, those of you who are married, if you're anything like me, when the night before your wedding, my best man took me out. Just he and I, <laughs> to Knott's Berry Farm, <laughs> where we rode roller coasters until we were sick, <laughs> till the wee hours of the morning. And I thought, this is really fun, but I want my bride. I want my bride. I know I get her tomorrow, but I want my bride. Listen, Jesus is in heaven with his Father at his Father's right hand. You are the bride of Christ, the Bible says, Christians. He wants his bride. He's not up there, and I think he gave us kind of a picture here with all of this, saying, Father, yes, son, I want my bride. Not right now. Okay. No, I think it's, I want my bride. Father, I want my bride. It's like any bridegroom anticipating the next day, even an arranged marriage. I want my bride. The Lord loves me. You. He wants you to be with him. He is anticipating the day when it comes, and only the Father can give permission to go. Be ready, the Bible said. Jesus said no fewer than ten times. Be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready. Be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready. Be ready. He's coming for his bride. But nobody knows when because only the Father can say, it's a Galilean wedding that he's using to drive home the point. Do you see it? Do you get it? And so, the bride, knowing that the day is upon them, rumors are around, it should be any time, she sleeps in this beautiful wedding gown. She has all her bridesmaids around her. Remember, they didn't have private rooms back then. So all of her sisters or friends, they're all dressed in white linen garments. They'll have veils too and headpieces and all of that and these oil lamps ready to go and they stay in the same room with her. <coughs> because traditionally... It was typical that the bridegroom would come at night. They got to be ready. And there, the bridegroom is with his boys. He's, in, he's, he's with his friends, his brothers, whoever's with him, and he's sleeping in his room. They're all together. And then one night, sometime within, oh, probably a day or two of the expected time, because the food's going to go bad. You know, they got to get doing on pretty quick. 
the father holding an oil lamp in the middle of the night comes in and stepping over all the guys he comes in and he finds his son holding the lamp and he goes son what get up why son get up why dad son go get your bride Boing! He springs to his feet. Oh, he's so excited. He grabs that ram's horn trumpet, that shofar, and he begins to blow on that to wake up the entire neighborhood, not just the household. This is the bride's alarm clock. You can hear it in the dead of night all through the village. Suddenly their family wakes up. The bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. Get ready. And they've got to hurry. They get her up. They start straightening out her clothes and knocking all the dust and the hay off of it, making sure that her makeup is right. Yes, they wore makeup back then. She would wear that behind her veil. Her hands would be painted with henna, both on the back of her hands and her palms as well as her feet. You say they do that in India. They do it in the Middle East, and they've done it that way for a thousand years, thousands of years. And they would paint the palms of her hands so that she couldn't do any work. They had to do it all for her. Ah, grace upon grace. And so they straighten everything out. She's ready to go, and they start lighting the lamps. In the meantime, the boy and all of his friends, they're waking up, and they start pounding on walls and beating drums and blowing Khalils and other noisemakers to try and wake up the, the entire neighborhood. The bridegroom typically would stand in the middle and revel in all the excitement, and the boys would dance around him singing songs and waking up the rest of the neighborhood again. Lots and lots of noise, and then grab shofars, grab torches, and then get this litter like this thing here. It might be like a chair like what you saw the bride come in on or it might be a platform between two poles it really doesn't matter they would drape cloth over the top to make it look beautiful they would grab this thing and with the bridegroom leading shouting the bridegroom is coming the bridegroom is coming Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they would begin to serpentine with the torches, shouting and blowing trumpets and making all the noise they could, shouting the bridegroom is coming, moving through all the streets of the village. Why? They're waking up the whole village. That's right. They're waking up the guests. The guests come down from where they were sleeping, throwing on their tunics and getting in line, maybe with a torch, maybe not. But they begin to revel in the festivities too, singing and dancing in the street and following what you saw with our, our group coming in was only about a dozen people. They had a line that grew and grew and grew as the guests got in line. And finally, as they serpentine through the streets, they come to the bride's house. And she, with her bridesmaids, in the middle of the night, have stepped out into the street. There aren't any street lights, folks. They're holding bowls with these oil lamps in them, like what you see on the table there. The oil lamps are burning olive oil, but they're all dressed in white. If you're holding the bowls under your face, can you imagine how that must look on a very, very dark street? I've seen this once before. It's one of the most breathtaking things I've ever seen. And as the bridegroom comes around the corner, and here is the bride in the middle of the street with her bridesmaids flanking her on either side, <coughs> holding these bowls of light, lighting them up from the waist up. Oh, it must have knocked the wind out of him. It's the greatest moment of his life when he sees his bride and all her beauty and her radiance. <coughs> Excuse me. And she's holding that. And, of course, here comes all the people behind him, and they push him out of the way. And the two guys carrying the litter, they come through with the litter, and they set it down. And the bride, with her bride, bridesmaids in tow, steps down onto the litter and sits down very queenly. And then the men pick her up off the ground with the bridegroom leading, making a beeline to the bridegroom's father's house, going straight there as fast as they can. With all the guests in tow, they fly the bride to the father's house where everybody goes inside the compound. And once they're all in, the gate is shut. No one goes out. No one comes in for seven days. You talk about a picture of the end of the world. Jesus talked about it over and over and over again, and yet it was all in the form of a Galilean wedding. And they get inside, 
And they, now they, she dismounts the litter and the bride and the groom sit down at a great table and the feast begins and there's prayers and there's songs and there's blessings and there's the presentation of gifts and then they begin to renew, not renew rather, but establish, reestablish that covenant in the presence of all where the bridegroom now at the table takes a piece of bread and he breaks it. He takes salt from one family in a little bag and salt from his own family in another bag and he pours it out on a single plate from two different families, two little piles of salt and then he stirs it all up and then he dips the bread into it and he feeds one half of the bread to his bride and he takes the other half and eats it. Why? It's called a covenant of salt. It's a ratification of the covenant. And that covenant of salt, I mean, here's the deal. From one family, from another family, you blend them together. You stir all the grains together. Now try and sort them out. You're one, inseparably one. And then they eat the bread. And then he does what they've been waiting for. He takes the cup of joy. He pours that pure wine, that ceremonial wine, only to be taken in sips. And then he takes the cup and he holds it up and prays. And then he takes the first sip. Then he hands it to his bride. And she takes the next sip, and all the party guests shout! Yeah! And they have ratified the covenant. She takes off her veil. They are now husband and wife. And they go from there, after a short time, over to his room that he made in that house. And there, while the party goes on downstairs, yeah, awkward moment, they consummate the marriage. And they come back, other traditions apply, and the wedding feast goes into high gear. Now you see it, don't you? Jesus talks about a Galilean wedding when he says, this is what it will be like when I come. But wait, it's not over. Because Revelation chapter 19 tells us something about that wedding. When John in Revelation chapter 19 sees and hears something amazing, he said, I heard, as it were, a great multitude. Now, the last time he saw a great multitude, it was 10,000 times 10,000 angels and thousands upon thousands and an uncountable number of saints behind them, all singing and shouting and praising God at the same time. We're talking billions. A lot of people are going to get saved, folks. I'm so glad, but there's going to be a lot of saved people in heaven. And shouting all at once, they're like, a, like the roar of a, of a rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, as John describes it. He says, I heard them shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb, the Lamb is Jesus, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride <clears throat> has made herself ready. And then John adds an interesting phrase, fine linen, white and clean, was given her to wear. She belongs there in the presence of God in heaven. That's a wedding where you're going to be there. You're going to be at that. You're the bride. He's the bridegroom. You gotta come to the wedding. And that's the wedding. Now, I don't know what that wedding's actually gonna be like. We have one more clue I'm gonna mention in just a minute before we start wrapping up. But I remember my wedding. My bride and I have been married for 36 years. I look in the mirror and I go, what happened to me? Man. She is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. She is wonderful. 36 years ago, I walked out on a stage in a room that was many times this size. It seated 2,700 people. There were 300 guests, witnesses, in the middle of the room. We were just a blip in this vast, vast room. As I stepped out on the stage, I looked like a glass of milk. I had an all-white polyester late 70s style tuxedo, <laughs> bell-bottoms, white ruffles going down the front. You know what it was like. Some of you are laughing because it was yours too, wasn't it? Of course, I was a hippie. My hair was so long I could reach up my back and grab it. I'm standing out there on the stage. My groomsmen off to my right, five men dressed in 
the same exact tuxedo, except in that late 1970s light blue, <laughs> with those light blue ruffles coming down the front. And the pastor, a little fire hydrant of a man who was a master sergeant for 33 years, when he said, do you say I do, you said, sir, yes, sir. And as he's standing behind me, I am looking down that center aisle with the two big doors at the back. My friend is playing music on the stage. The music changes. The doors open. And it's a bridesmaid. Yeah, I knew she was coming, but I don't want a bridesmaid. I want my bride. And she walks down the aisle and walks up the four steps to the top. And here comes the next one and the next one and the next one. And finally, the matron of honor. And she comes down, and I am watching her as she ascends the stairs, and she looks over at me, and she winks. No, this is not a flirt. This was a wink that said, wait till you see what's coming. The doors close at the back. The music changes, and the doors open again, and there she is. Finally, my bride, Kathy. And she's standing there, and to this day, Having done hundreds of weddings personally, she is wearing the most beautiful wedding gown I have ever seen to date. She has a veil that's very sheer, covering her head that comes all the way down to her waist to a point, right where her hands are gathering white flowers rimmed with dark green shiny leaves that go almost all the way down to her feet. And she's smiling, and her teeth are perfect, and her eyes are sparkling because they're brown, and you can see them in the light. And she's mine. And she begins to come down the aisle with her father on her arm. Of course, her father looks like a WWF wrestler with a shaved head, a package of hot dogs behind his neck, poured into one of these light blue tuxedos with the ruffles coming down, with a look on his face of being the proud papa, but also looking at me like you'd better treat her right. And as he walks down the aisle, he stops right in between the two pews. I descend down the stairs. I shake his hand. I don't know if he said anything to me or not. It didn't matter at that moment. I took my wife's arm, my bride's arm, and we walked back up the stairs one step at a time until we stood in front of the pastor. And she looked at me. And Disneyland fireworks are going off in her eyes. Ah, oh, there's love. And her smile is so perfect. And I was so blessed. And the pastor began to speak, and I don't remember much about what he said, because I had my bride. What will the day Jesus presents you, bride, to himself be like? Will there be an aisle? Will there be a stage? You know, it really doesn't matter. All we know is that the best description of what happens next is in, of all places, the book of Ephesians, where Paul in giving instruction to husbands, said this. And in this statement, he described what's going to happen with you. And more than that, he described God's plan for everything he ever did from the time he spoke the universe into being until eternity future is all summed up in one single statement. It begins, husbands love your wives. We're going to take that and set that aside for now. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word. You need to understand that the Greek form of that word, washing with water, if you translate it into Hebrew, only comes out in one word. <laughs> Mikvah. Cleansing her with the washing with water through the word that he may present her to himself, a radiant bride, holy, blameless, without any stain or wrinkle. That's the purpose for which God made the universe. It's the purpose for which the fall of man occurred and the redemption of man through Christ came because he did all of this to bring a bride to himself for all eternity. And throughout all eternity, from the moment the marriage feast of the Lamb takes place, when you find Jesus, you find his bride with him. They are never separate. Amen. That's you. And here's the best part. He's going to present you to himself. What does that look like? I don't know. What do you look like, radiant? You say, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Radiant! But I've done some terrible things. 
radiant. He's cleansed you. He's washed you. He's made you appropriate for himself. Radiant. But I've said, but I did, but I haven't. Radiant. He looks upon you and he says, I finally have you. I've loved you and you will never be parted from me forever. I think, I think that in all eternity there is one best day, the best day of forever. One day, I think it's Jesus' best day. It seems that everything points to it. Remember, God made the world, why? Bring in a bride. That Jesus died on the cross, why? To forgive us our sins, to cleanse us, to make us radiant so that he has a radiant bride. It all ends up at that marriage of you and him. And everything that Christ did that God did in this world points to that one day. I think it's Jesus' best day, and it's going to be yours too. And, oh, by the way, it was made in a covenant in his blood with that cup. And it's until death us do part, and he never dies again. He is risen. He never dies again. And this is why marriage is sacred. Marriage is sacred. Everywhere in the world with every civilization and every culture exists one commonality, marriage. And you've got to ask why. How is it that they, everybody has the same thing? It's done different ways, it's got different traditions, but it's always there. Why? I think God primed the pump for the best day of forever by putting it in the hearts of every person in the world from history past until the day he comes back that marriage is vital, that marriage is sacred, that marriage is important because everybody seems to believe in it. And that, to me, is an evidence for God and for Christ. But even more than that, marriage is not some tradition or spiritual mating ceremony. It is a walking, talking, living, breathing intent by God to show the world of how the husband is to love the bride and the bride is to respond to the husband. It's a living, breathing model of him and what he wants to do by bringing us to him. He's showing everybody through every wedding the future. And there's another thing. This is why, and this is going to stir some of you, this is why living together outside of the covenant of marriage is a sin. It's wrong. Because why? It doesn't look like Jesus. He made a covenant, and the covenant doesn't let him out of it. He can't ever walk away. The reason two people live without marriage is so that if something goes wrong, they can part any way they want to. Jesus said, and it does apply to a marriage covenant, any covenant for that matter, I will never leave you or forsake you. Why? Because he doesn't want to? That's part of it. But because he can't, that's all of it. He cannot. He made a covenant. He can't leave you. He made a covenant. This is why fornication is wrong. Jesus doesn't hit and run. This is why any perversion of marriage that doesn't look like Christ and his church is wrong because it's not speaking of him. It's a degradation of that which he said was so sacred. This is why he hates divorce. Remember, behold, I make how many things new? Remember that. But remember, from here on out, you know and you understand because we are all witnesses and the witnesses said, Amen. so we know that, listen, he hates divorce because he will never divorce you. That's why. That's a Galilean wedding. And it's taught throughout the Bible. And you're the bride. And he's the bridegroom. I'm going to read you two things, and then we're done. <clears throat> the first one is in a passage of Scripture that most of you don't read very often. It's in Song of Solomon. Oh! 
There's, it's like a drama. There are three parts. There's the beloved, who is the bride, the betrothed bride. And there's the bridegroom, the betrothed bridegroom, and then there's a chorus that chimes in. The bride speaks. She said, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, listen to me. My lover is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. He's very romantic here. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. He's pounding on her door in the middle of the night. His hair is wet with the dew from the night. That's pretty romantic, ladies. You know this. Guys learn the lesson. I don't understand this woman, though, because her next words are, I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've taken off my, I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? But my lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. He's trying to jimmy open the door. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my lover. My hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. If you've never smelled myrrh, it's really beautiful. And she could smell it because he touched it. His perfume rubbed off on her door. But his hand is gone now. I opened for my lover. But my lover had left. He was gone and my heart had gone out to him when he spoke. I looked for him, but I couldn't find him. I called him, but he didn't answer. He was gone. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my cloak, those watchmen on the walls. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. The friends chime in. Here's the chorus. How is your beloved better than others, most beautiful of women? How is your beloved better than others that you charge us so? She describes him. My lover is radiant. I love that word. And ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is purest gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. <coughs> His arms are rods of gold set with chrysolite. His body is like polished ivory decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon. His choice is its cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. And this is your bridegroom. Oh, yes, very romantic language, but it's, as far as I'm concerned, being human language, falls far short of the reality. The lover has left, and he's coming back. All the way to the last chapter in the whole Bible. Revelation chapter 22 where as John is summing up this incredible prophecy, Jesus speaks there in chapter 22, there in verse 7, where he says, Behold, I am coming soon. Coming soon just because he's coming soon? No, this is a bridegroom speaking to a bride as a bridegroom. How do you know? Read on. Behold, I am coming soon. Verse 12, he says it again. Behold, I am coming soon and my reward is with me. <clears throat> he says it again. Verse 17, we have the next line actually. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, he who testifies to these things, second to the last verse in the whole Bible, he who testifies to these things, Jesus Christ the Lord, written in red in your red letter Bible, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's why a Galilean wedding is important. That's why God brought you here tonight. And through all of that, how much does Jesus love you? Christmas.
Steel.